Thank you for joining us today for the last youth webinar in our Creating a Better Future series. I am Kyle Dine, Program Coordinator for Food Allergy Canada, and today we will be discussing managing anxiety and bullying with registered social worker Samara Carroll. But before we get started, I want to note a few items. One, this presentation is for informational purposes only and will not provide specific medical advice, recommendations, diagnosis, or treatment. Please talk to your doctor about any concerns or questions you may have regarding your own health or your child's health. All participants are muted so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the chat or question box throughout the webinar. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And lastly, this webinar will be recorded and shared on foodallergycanada.ca afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or share it with others. I would like to now introduce Samara. And Samara has her Master of Social Work from University of Toronto, as well as an MA from York University. She is a registered social worker who has worked with children and families in a clinical and community setting for more than 10 years. In her private practice, Carol Counseling, she counsels children, teenagers, and families to manage food allergy-related anxiety. She will now discuss how to manage food allergy, anxiety, and bullying with us. So thank you for joining us today, Samara, and welcome. Hi, thank you so much. All right, so I'm gonna begin my presentation on managing anxiety and bullying with food allergies. Here's just a brief overview of what today's talk will cover, who I am and what I do, food allergy bullying experiences, common issues related to anxiety and bullying. We're gonna look at five key strategies, looking towards the future, and then we'll go back for a Q&A. So as Kyle mentioned, I'm Samara Carroll. I've had food allergies and at risk of anaphylaxis since I was two years old. I'm a social worker, a therapist, and a mother, and I have a practice called Carroll Counseling working with families dealing with food allergy anxiety. And I have over 10 years of experience counseling children and families. Now for food allergy bullying experience, I'm gonna share briefly some of my personal story. I'm gonna talk about common experiences of bullying, and I'm gonna talk about normalizing and validating these experiences. So when I was two, I was diagnosed as having food allergies and at risk of anaphylaxis. And I grew up in the late 80s and the 1990s where there was not as much awareness about food allergies as there is today. There were a lot of times I can remember of having to explain my allergy to my friends, my friends' parents, my teachers, and family members. And I had a few experiences of bullying that have driven me to do this work with food allergy counseling. I can think of a time when I was on the playground and another kid said he was gonna throw peanut shells on me. It was a very scary experience. And looking back on the experience, it was not dealt with appropriately. I didn't ask for help and the teachers didn't know what was going on. And it was very scary. I still think about it to this day. There were many times where I was worried um, to go to friends' birthday parties. One time I was told I couldn't go to the birthday party because the kids would rather eat M&Ms than have me there. And these experiences are obviously really hurtful. They have always stuck with me. And those are, you know, part of the reason I want to do this kind of work because I understand some of the experiences that people dealing with food allergy face. I know that there are many different experiences of bullying related to food allergy. And I really believe in normalizing these experiences as someone who's experienced them myself and validating them, meaning that we can look at them together and recognize that they're happening and they're hurtful and they're affecting us. But then I also believe in finding ways to deal with them, in looking at common issues and finding coping strategies so that we can live very happy, full lives. And even though I've had these negative experiences, 
I also look back on my childhood in really positive ways and have learned lots of great ways of dealing with food allergy bullying and food allergy anxiety. And so now I like to work with people to share all the skills I have so that everyone like me can live really full and happy lives. So as mentioned, when you're dealing with food allergy, bullying and anxiety, there are common issues that come up. Issues such as exclusion, guilt and shame, self-isolation, depression, nervousness and anxiety. And in my counseling work, I work with children, preteens, teens and adults. And while everyone is at different stages of their allergy journey, they're all still dealing with many of these issues. And many have experienced different forms of bullying related to that. So to go into a bit more detail, exclusion leads to people feeling that they're not part of social events, friends and family gatherings, feeling that whether it's them actively being excluded or more subtle ways of exclusion, people feel that they can't be a part of other simple things that others enjoy in life, like different celebrations. Guilt and shame. A lot of the people I work with feel embarrassed about their allergy. They don't wanna share their allergy with friends or family. They don't wanna be singled out as that person with the allergy. They don't wanna be a burden. And sometimes this is their own thinking, thinking, oh, well, if I go and I have to share my allergy, it's gonna make people not wanna hang out with me, whether or not this is true or not. And sometimes it is that other people have made them feel this way and have said, you know, oh, if you come to this though, we're gonna have to make sure the food's safe and maybe that seems like a hassle for them and different attitudes make them feel this guilt and shame. So often what happens is it ends up happening, people have self-isolation, choosing to isolate, to not participate in social events, not wanting to advocate about their allergy. So they choose instead, they're just gonna stay home, right? Instead of going out and having to talk about their allergy and share their allergy, they're just gonna stay home. And leading to this is depression, loneliness and isolation. When we stay home, when we're not doing things that we love to do normally, when we start to feel bad about ourselves, this can lead to depression. And finally, many of the people I work with are dealing with nervousness and anxiety. There's an ongoing feeling of general unease, not feeling equipped or confident to deal with food allergies, feeling always a bit of tension, feeling in different parts of your body, like something's just not right, and it can affect all facets of life. And we'll go into this in more detail. Now, while these are all common issues and can be normal ways of dealing with food allergy, anxiety, and bullying, I'm gonna delve into, um, in a few minutes, how we can look at them in more positive ways. And I'm gonna hone in on two different people I've worked with and what helped them deal with this. So I'm just gonna share a few stats from Food Allergy Canada resources to put this in a bit more context. Food allergy is associated with symptoms of anxiety and depression as discussed. Almost 50% describe their anxiety levels eight out of 10 or higher related to food allergy. One in three children with food allergies report being bullied because of their allergy. Now this is a very upsetting statistic when I first saw it, um, but I think we can all relate to this. And as discussed, there's been times where this comes up, but I think it's really important to talk about what experiences can we do to move forward and what can we learn so that we're able to be in a position where these things are part of our life, but they're not dominating our life. And we're able to enjoy more positive stories related to our food allergies. Now, I'm, when I move on, I just want to note that I've changed the names and the details of the clients I'm going to be talking about to protect their own privacy and confidentiality. Amy's story. 
Amy was a 12 year old girl. She came to meet with me on a weekly basis for three months leading up to her big soccer tournament. Amy was on a big competitive soccer team and she had an upcoming trip outside of the city. She was nervous about many things related to eating in an environment that wasn't familiar to her. She was nervous about all the snacks that were gonna be eaten on the bus. She was nervous about having to stop at fast food restaurants along the way. And she was really nervous about a big dinner party that they were having for a bunch of the teams where she wanted to be able to go and celebrate, but she was so nervous about the food and it was at a restaurant. And a few months before Amy came to me, she had had an allergic reaction at a restaurant. So this of course led her to feel very nervous when thinking about eating at a restaurant, especially with lots of people. And she was very nervous about feeling excluded and not being a part of the team. So there was a lot going on for her. Now I'm gonna go into more detail about what we worked on together. But before that, I'm just going to highlight one other story. So this is Saul's story. Saul was a 15-year-old guy, recently developed allergies. So he had to deal with a whole new identity of taking on what it was like to have food allergies when he wasn't used to this. He didn't know how to cope with food allergies. This wasn't something he had faced in his life before. Saul used to love to go to his friends' homes, he'd go to the park and play sports, and he was a pretty carefree guy. But all of a sudden, he started avoiding doing the things he loved because a few times when he came, he was wearing his upper pen and some of his friends teased him about him and told him it looked silly. This caused him, of course, to feel embarrassed about wearing his upper pen and feeling like maybe my friends don't understand what I'm going through. He decided it wasn't worth it to explain what his EpiPen did or to tell his friends about some of the nervous feelings he was dealing with. And therefore he just started to isolate. He decided to not go meet up with friends. He decided to stay home. And this was very tough for him because he was a really social guy before and all of a sudden he was staying at home feeling depressed and isolated. So I'm gonna delve into why we helped. I'm gonna first talk about why anxiety can be useful. And then we're gonna talk about how to find a balance between dealing with anxiety and also enjoying life. So anxiety can be useful. And I know we're gonna discuss um, a webinar by Joanne Gillespie a bit later. But the important piece is that, as I know, people with food allergies, we need to have a level of anxiety that is normal. It's a normal response to a challenge or threat. And so we go around with food allergies, needing to ask about ingredients, needing to make sure that we feel safe, that our environment is safe and we are comfortable. But when we have too much anxiety, it can manifest as physical and psychological symptoms. And then we respond by the fight, flight, freeze response to help us avoid danger. And while this can be a useful tool with anxiety, we also need to look at ways when the anxiety is too much, when it's affecting our life too much and when we're not able to enjoy other aspects of our life and it's affecting our quality of life. So how do I do that? I work on a number of evidence-based strategies, and I'm just going to briefly go into one. But the main strategy I use is cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, is really effective in dealing with anxiety. The idea is I work with the clients, whether they're children, youth, adults, or teens, on short-term goals. We work together to help them identify their goals. The concept is basically that a situation happens, then we develop a thought, which leads to an emotion and then a behavior. Now, what I do is I work to challenge some of those thoughts, emotions, and behaviors so that people are not just going into their beliefs and thinking that, oh, okay, well now forever, I have to avoid eating at a restaurant, for example 
but rather we challenge those thoughts and try to find ways where they can potentially reach their goals. So for example, with Amy, we work together on challenging her thoughts. Okay, so first she has an allergic reaction. That's the situation. It leads to a thought, I can never eat safe food again. This then leads to feelings of anxiety and nervousness, which ultimately leads to avoidance and isolation. Now, we try to change these thinking patterns and these emotional responses by using effective coping strategies. I always work with the clients and follow their leads on attainable, achievable goals. And again, we always acknowledge that, especially with this type of work with food allergies, we have to ensure that at all times, people with food allergies are safe, that they're going at their own pace, and that they're feeling comfortable. So how do we do this? These five strategies that I'll go into in more detail are rooted in these evidence-based practices such as CBT, as well as exposure therapy and play-based therapy. Exposure therapy is part of the cognitive behavioral therapy process where we find ways that clients can challenge themselves to expose themselves to a situation that may make them nervous. Again, always within a safe framework. And play-based therapy is using more interactive ideas such as role play, games, visualizations, drawing, and acting. So more interactive tools that can be really helpful, especially for younger kids. While every client is different, I work with them on all of these five strategies developed at their own pace. All of these strategies give skills to let, allow individuals with food allergy to be more confident, better at self-advocating, and to feel more sense of self-worth about their allergy. These strategies allow you to develop resiliency and look towards finding the balance between vigilance and enjoying life with food allergy anxiety. So I'll read through them briefly now, and then I'll use them with the examples of Amy and Saul to show how I dealt with them. Fear ladder, worry time, breathing visualization, self-advocacy, and identity. The concept of the fear ladder is that you work your way up the rungs of the fear ladder to prioritize fears and anxiety levels. You work slowly, always checking your comfort level and always being safe. So with Amy's case, I'll show you what we did. Now, just to remind you, Amy was 12 years old. She was really nervous about an upcoming soccer tournament. She was nervous about eating in so many different public communal spaces. And specifically, she was nervous about going to the restaurant, thinking that even just by being in the restaurant, what if she had a reaction? She was nervous about exclusion. She wasn't sleeping at night and she was dealing with many fears and anxiety. So Amy decided after a lot of discussion that her first goal was gonna be to be comfortable sitting at a restaurant. This did not mean that she had to eat at the restaurant, but she wanted to get to a level before the tournament where she wasn't filled with worry before going to the restaurant. And then she decided, and there were other steps along the way, but that her final step at the top of the ladder would be eating at a restaurant. Now, we checked in and decided this probably wasn't a realistic goal for the upcoming trip because there were a lot of steps she wanted to take before she felt completely comfortable eating at the restaurant. And also we wanted to acknowledge that she had had a very scary experience at a restaurant so it wasn't gonna be a quick fix. We wanted to respect that it had been very scary when she had a reaction. So instead we said, well, let's first focus on how you can deal with just being at the restaurant. And so that was her first goal of the fear ladder. And I'm gonna describe in more detail how we moved towards getting her to achieve that goal. But the fear ladder is a really helpful concept because it's visual and you can identify your fears from the thing that scares you the least to the thing that scares you the most, and then slowly work your way up the ladder. And also 
once you've achieved the lowest part of the ladder, and again, this can take time, usually your confidence has been built up, your resiliency. And so with lots of my clients, once, once they've achieved the first step, they feel ready to take on the next rung of the ladder. The next concept is worry time. The idea is to designate a time in the day to express worries. As consistent worries and anxious thoughts come to your head, you push worries to this time of day, and it's really helpful to do it with someone. So this was really effective for Amy because in the few weeks leading up to the trip, she would go up to her parents multiple times in the day, asking them for reassurance that she would be safe on the trip, and also asking a lot of what if, like what if even when we tell them not to bring anything I'm allergic to, there's things I'm allergic to, or what if we have to stop at this place on the bus, and just a lot of hypothetical what ifs. And so the idea is not to say, well, don't think about it and don't worry at all, but the idea is to find a way to control the consistent worries and the thoughts that keep coming up. So Amy's parents worked with her to find a time and day when they were both feeling relaxed. Usually it was after school and they would say, okay, now it's worry time. They would sit for 20 minutes and Amy knew that during this time, she had the space to share all her worries, everything that was on her mind with her family. Sometimes they would give responses, but sometimes they would just listen. And then that was it. And then generally she was able to move on with the day better and to sleep better at night. And throughout the day, as the worries came to her mind, she was able to say, all right, I'm noticing that I'm feeling worry right now. I'm noticing that I'm feeling anxious, but I'm gonna push the worry to worry time. So I'm recognizing that I'm feeling this way, but I'm gonna push it a bit forward. And the idea is if this becomes a consistent practice, you end up not worrying as much during the day because you learn how to recognize the feeling, accept it, and push it away. And sometimes then when the time comes for worry time, you don't have 20 minutes worth of worry. Now, another technique, and we'll use Saul as an example for this one. So just to remind you, Saul is a 15-year-old boy, and he had a recent diagnosis of food allergy. He was dealing with a lot of worries around exclusion, dealing with depression and isolation. And he was very worried because he had had some experiences of his friends making fun of his at the 10. And he was worried about being at the parks and at his friends' homes. Um, what if he had a reaction or what if he was feeling anxious? So we started off really simply with Saul, but finding effective ways of breathing and visualization is a really great tool and it's one that you can always have with you. We started by Saul picking out a place that he feels calm and happy and safe in. He picked a forest where him and his family used to go camping. And we worked our way to imagine what the forest looked like, smelled like, and you go through all five senses, what was in his mind the picture of calm and relaxation. And so when he started to have anxious thoughts, he was able to calm himself by just pausing, by just practicing really great deep breathing and doing the visualization. And this also helped prepare him for when he was going to social events. If he did this a few minutes before, it would usually distract him. It would shift the feelings of anxiety to another part in his body and he was able to go and take on the day a bit more easy. Self-advocacy is a really important strategy that I worked with both Amy and Saul on. The idea is to learn to share your allergy concerns and needs, to practice in different settings, and to plan. So in Amy's case, we worked on ways that she could work on self-advocacy before the trip. She sent out an email to her coach and her teammates, telling them about her allergies and also giving them suggestions about safe snacks that they could bring. She also worked with her family 
on going to a restaurant where she sat and was able to feel a bit more relaxed. While she didn't eat the first time she went to the restaurant, she decided she was gonna go sit with her family and have an experience similar to where she would be at another restaurant with her teammates. She also decided to talk to a few friends in more detail where she shared with them some of the stuff that she was feeling and what had been going on for her. So it's really important that she was able to think ahead so she didn't show up to the restaurant tired with 20 people, it was noisy and she didn't know if it would be safe for her. She planned ahead of time by researching where they were going, by talking to people about her concerns, and of course, by planning safe meals and snacks that she would be able to eat along the way if she decided she wasn't gonna eat anywhere else. And with Saul, this was also a process. We talked with Saul about ways he could explain why he needs his EpiPen to his friends. We talked about ways he could share with his friends why he wasn't so comfortable going to a remote park that was far away from the hospital and from his house. And we talked about how he could do this and how he could do it ahead of time so that when fun social events happened, the pressure wasn't all on him to share it all at once. And a lot of the worries were about what if I'm ruining the fun and what if I'm bringing it down? So if we're able to advocate for ourselves leading up to these situations, it can help a lot. And this really connects to the piece around identity. Making your allergy a part of who you are is something I believe strongly in and building your support network. So for example, I believe that incorporating and celebrating your allergy as part of your identity is crucial. Recognizing it's not the only part of your identity, but it is a part of you. And as we know, food comes up in almost every aspect of life. So again, it's really important that your support networks know about your allergies and also know about some of the issues you may be going through. I worked with Saul and Amy on strategies where they could own their identity more. Some of the things that have been helpful for me are to introduce the allergy early, to not apologize, and to take matters into my own hands. So for example, introducing early would be when I joined, if let's say Amy joined the soccer team, one of the first practices, she says, oh, by the way, this is my EpiPen. I'm allergic to these things. And I would appreciate if you don't have to eat the food around me. Yes, and I know this is hard to do. And this is something I work with people on. But being able to bring it up early eventually gives people time to understand it, to ask questions. And then you don't have to wait till a last minute situation. Don't apologize. This is a big thing to work on, but we deserve to feel confident about our allergies and we don't have to feel bad. I really try to work with my clients to bring out the best in them so that they can feel comfortable and proud of who they are. And they can say, for example, Saul can say, well, we always have fun playing basketball together. If you're gonna make fun of my EpiPen, that's sort of just immature but we always have fun together. So can't we just accept this is one small part of me and go on and play. And taking matters into your own hands also has to do with providing options. So for example, Saul could say, hey, is it okay if we go to this um, park instead? Or how about I have people over for pizza tonight? And then he can choose where to order from and make sure it's a restaurant he feels safe with. So instead of isolating and excluding ourselves, we can try to find ways where we are empowered and we are able to bring people to our spaces to share things that make us feel safe and comfortable. It's a process and with Saul, it started slowly. He told one friend about his allergy. He asked one friend to come over. But what often happens is once it's normalized and shared with friends, then they're able to say, oh yeah, it's not such a big deal. And they can even share it with other friends. So it just becomes sort of built into the conversation, but it's not something where he has to go around telling each person about his allergy. 
And I also think it's helpful sometimes to talk to people about this, that everyone has something, everyone has a unique identity and has something that they have to deal with. And for us, food allergy is one of those things. So we're gonna move gears a bit, um, but we thought it was important to mention about allergies during and beyond COVID-19. Of course, we all know we're in very strange times right now. We're dealing with a lot of extra stressors, but we thought that maybe this could be a time where we're able to educate other people about what some of the challenges are that people with food allergies have to deal with all the time. So we're in situations now where people are very aware of worries about cross-contamination, worries about cleaning surfaces, and overall awareness and understanding of cleanliness. And I think it's important to, you know, find times where we can share that this is what we do when we have food allergies. We always have to think about, are the surfaces clean? Or what is the food being shared? Or what situations we're in? So I guess, the hope is that when this ends, and hopefully it will end very soon, we're able to remember with other people who don't have food allergies, these were some of the things we all had to think about. And when you have food allergy, you're always gonna have to think about them, but it's okay. And it's just part of our life and we can incorporate that. So the key takeaways I wanna go over are, you're not alone. I've been through this for my whole life, and I know that there's many other people going through this. And there's a whole community of people with food allergies who in my work I see there's common themes coming up all the time and people are experiencing very similar things. It's okay to take small steps. Again, anxiety and bullying related to food allergy are serious issues and we can start off slow and take small steps but even just taking one small step can be really helpful. It's important to try the strategies. The five strategies I shared are just the beginning, but they're really effective and there are things you can remember. There are things you can take with you when you're out and about. And continue to build your support network. Find the people who get it. Find the people who you can really share it with, the people who don't make you feel bad about your allergy, the people who understand. And look towards them, as well as other resources, to continue to help build your support network. Now I'll hand it back to Kyle. Thanks so much, Samara. I just wanted to go through a few additional resources and then we'll get into the Q&A portion. So uh, please feel free to start submitting any questions that might have come up during uh, Samara's talk. But we have had a series of webinars over the past while that have been very helpful and, and very related to this topic. And one in particular being on the emotional and social challenges experienced by families with food allergy. And that was with Dr. Joanne Gillespie. And it really dives on a different level of this topic, more on a broader scale, more on the theoretical side. So if this is an area of interest, uh, I would definitely recommend that one. And we also did some really uh, interesting, fun, practical uh, webinars, one with a CFL football player, Thomas Miles, titled, Food Allergies Don't Define Me, where uh, he came up with a really clever tagline of own it, accept it, control it. And it was very empowering. So I, I definitely encourage that one. And then one that I, I ran last month titled Rock Your Food Allergy, which is another empowering uh, part of this series. So definitely recommend our webinar series um, and more that we have there. We also have some resources specific to anxiety on our website, as you can see on the link there, uh, with, with more worksheets um, that you can view or download. We have a youth section on our website. If you're looking for more resources for your child, for your teen, preteen, we have some really, really helpful um, content there, as well as a book for teens that's free to download. So I highly encourage that. And then lastly, we have our Allergy Pals, Allergy Allies program, which it is an online mentorship program for youth ages seven to 15. And it has been transformational for participants in building confidence in key social areas, as well as just creating peer, peer support. 
So I highly recommend that program. And um, we're just finishing a session now and it gets started back in the fall and it takes place in the winter and spring as well. And with that, I'm going to go into the question portion of today's webinar where I will ask Samara to turn on her webcam and I will turn on mine and we'll start answering some of your questions. Perfect. Great to see you, Samara. Thank you so much for all of the really helpful information. My pleasure. So we we had quite a few people register for today's session and a lot of questions came in in advance and we will be monitoring the questions that uh, that come in during during this Q&A. But we'll start off with some of these questions that, that we, we found in advance. And there was really kind of some overarching themes that we found. So we'll kind of go theme through theme, starting kind of on the more broad and getting a little bit more specific as we go. So um, the first really is, can you speak to some of the root causes of allergy related anxiety? Is it mostly from experiences or can it actually be picked up from someone else, others anxieties? And I guess, what, what about the impact of parental anxiety on youth with food allergies? Do you have any tips for parents in that regard? Sure. Yeah, so both I've seen both things. I think um, I think the majority of the clients I work with have come to me after having the reaction. So that's the majority. Like they've experienced something that's obviously really scary, and maybe things were going okay before, and then all of a sudden they have an experience where they're thinking, "Well, now how am, am I supposed to trust food, or how am I supposed to trust these people?" Um, and then that can lead to a lot of anxiety. So I think. I think that's the most common experience, but then of course the parental piece really adds to it. Um, it's So I work with a lot of children and youth, and so I do work with the parents as well. And I think it's pretty clear that every parent I work with is trying to do the best they can and is extremely supportive. But yes, the anxiety of parents can obviously be picked up from kids. Um, and it's a combination of parents needing to also adjust um, with the diagnosis of food allergy, because for a lot of parents, it's new to them also. So I, first of all, I recommend that parents do the work themselves, even though they're not the ones with the food allergy in these cases, they need to also work on the strategies that can really help them. Um, but also the, the piece around figuring out how much to share with their kid and how much not to. So I try to work sometimes with the family as a whole, to find coping strategies for them. And if I can sense that the anxiety is really being picked up by the kid from their parents, I will ask sometimes to have a session just with the parents. Um, you know, parents have to be strong for their kids all the time. And I think with food allergy, it is really hard because there's so many unknowns and it's constant, right? But I think really having the practical goals, we know so many parents who have learned to become amazing bakers because their kids can't eat the foods, right? Or parents who really have friends over, their kids' friends over all the time, finding ways where it can be in a strength-based way, where they're not just sitting and worrying, but rather they're saying, well, what can we do to make you still have like a social life and a full life? So trying to frame it in that way is really helpful. Wonderful. Um, and this, this is a question that I'm sure um, a lot of parents would, would be struggling with, where in terms of anxiety, you have one, one end of the spectrum, which is being too cavalier with your allergies. I know that's a concern, especially with, with teenagers. And then you have the other end, which is you know too much anxiety. How do you strike the balance in the middle? What, what tips do you have there? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, that's a huge issue. Um, and yeah, I think especially as they become teenagers, parents worry a lot um, because developmentally things happen, right? And so I think it's really about just from the beginning, having like your foundational base of the things that are, this is what we're comfortable with as a family, right? Because some families make certain decisions that are different than other families. But for our specific family, we only go to this restaurant or we only, we don't eat foods that may contain or whatever it is, you sort of have the foods that like are what you live by, the strategies and principles, and you as a family decide them collectively. And then you are, you are able to sort of make other decisions because you have your foundation and you have your basis. So you're able to say, okay, well, you can go to that sleepover, 
but you know that we always go back to that we call ahead of time or that this is our plan. So nothing, um, you know, things come up and nothing is that new um, because it can be also really exhausting and stressful to have to navigate every new situation. But if you sort of have your go-to principles that you've decided as a family, and there's gonna be some things that parents will say are non-negotiable. -negoti For example, teenagers who wanna wear an EpiPen, that's a big one that comes up. And you know, some teenagers will say, I'm just gonna put it in my backpack and you have different responses, right? Some parents say that's enough. Some parents say, no, you still have to wear it. So sort of navigating those things. But if it's decided as a family that these are the things we adhere to, but we're also gonna let you go to friends, go to sleepover, go to camp, whatever it may be, then you sort of have um, an understanding that safety is at the core but then we're letting you explore, we're letting you live your life. I also find that there's a lot of anxiety leading up to situations in families. So when people are feeling like going to summer camp for the first time or going to travel, going away to university or college, like all of these things, it's the fear of the unknown and it's the planning that creates so much in anxiety. But once their kid actually goes, they say, oh, it was successful, usually, right? This was a positive experience. And then you can build from that. Yeah, it's almost the, the fear ladder for parents in situations yeah. like that, going yeah. step by step. Yeah. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you. And you know, one, one more um, in terms of in, in introducing and, and trying to, to have your family all on the same page. I remember this talk specifically with my parents, and maybe you do as well when you were young, but how do you recommend introducing the topic of severity of food allergy, of anaphylactic reactions? Um, I, don't, I'm, I think my parents did a pretty good job, but what's the gold yeah. standard? What, 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 yeah, what? yeah. I think mine also did a good job, but I mean, I know now like there's so many resources. So I think the diagrams and the posters are really helpful. So of course it's very scary and you have to do it in a way that's age appropriate. So when you're young, there's a way to describe it, right? That's more like general, you know, you're gonna have a funny feeling potentially if you eat this or the second you eat something and you feel swelling in your mouth, whatever, you know, your reaction may be, you come and tell us right away. But you also wanna incorporate the EpiPen from a really young age. So I remember being really young and practicing with the fake ones like on an orange. I was quite young, but learning that and then also I learned from my parents. So anytime, and they would let me go to play dates, they would let me go out. But anytime they would take me there, they would explain to the kid's parent, like, this is how you use the EpiPen. And I remember sort of feeling embarrassed, like, okay, you told them this last week, you don't have to tell them again. But my mom, like every time would take me, she would show them, she would explain what my reaction could be like. So it was sort of just ingrained in me. Um, and then I think it's, again, as life happens and you reach different developmental milestones, it's always there. So it's, okay, now you want to go to a sleepover and you're 10 years old, what do we have to go over? So you kind of keep reintroducing it, but trying to incorporate it with something positive, right? With something that's about something fun and something enjoyable, because otherwise it's just, it's going to bring you down and it's going to, I think create more anxiety, but we can't forget about having to constantly talk about it also. Great points, you know, just in how to address it. Um, we have a few from the audience. Um, we'll do one for right now where someone mentioned, can you, you talked about worry time and can children write their worries in a journal to share at a later time? Is that a good strategy? That's a great strategy. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Also, um, sometimes kids who are more visual, they can make like a tree, they can draw a tree, and then each leaf of the tree is a worry. So the idea is when they think of a worry, they write it on a leaf and they kind of hang it on the tree and it's there again to revisit later. Um, you can also visualize it like a bubble. So, you know, the worry comes up as a bubble. They can, you know, see the worry and then pop it. And again, all of this is not to say you're not coming back to it, but yeah, it's visual ways of trying to postpone the worry, especially when they're those consistent and persistent worries. So yeah, that's a great idea. Great, thank you um, to whoever asked that question. And you know, th this is um, a, a big question. I'm sure that you, you deal with a lot of clients that have experienced this, but in terms of the post 
reaction anxiety uh how to help someone not be so worried after uh after a severe reaction mm -hmm. yeah so i see a lot of people dealing with this and i mean the truth is we what i say to people often is like we have to respect the fact that this was really scary and we we aren't going to rush on the first session into getting them to go back to a restaurant for example like that doesn't seem realistic um, and you can tell when people are sharing their experience of that post reaction there there you can sense that there's so much emotion and fear and so I kind of always acknowledge I know it's hard to talk about and it's important that I know what happened, but then we're going to move forward towards more positive things. Um, so kind of the first session usually after the post reaction is just about making them feel that it is okay to be sad and worried about it. You know, some people say they have post-traumatic stress about it, especially when they've had multiple serious reactions. It's, so it, of course, it's something to take very seriously. But most people I work with also do want to change and do want to go back to the things they were doing before. Um, so, you know, a lot of helpful strategies, and again, with time, are about looking at, okay, how many times have you eaten food that was safe? And you had the one time with the reaction. So, you know, trying to do those kind of, um, they're like thought exercises and different ways, like the CBT stuff of um, trying to challenge the thinking and making them remember all those times they were safe, right? And how many meals do they eat in a week? And you kind of like, if people are more, um, like some people like the math, so you actually ask them to calculate it, just really to show the point that yes, we can't 100% guarantee that you won't have another reaction, but it is not the norm. So trying to view it in that way. Um, but yeah, and really just giving them time to feel supported and understood and then work towards them um, with their goals. And the goals can be really simple, but like there's never a silly goal, whatever they wanna focus on first, because usually once they focus on that goal, then and they've achieved it whether it takes like a week or multiple weeks or months then they're always ready to take on the next piece so it's really about like getting them to that first step it's really helpful and you know i remember after my severe anaphylactic reaction my most severe one um it, it those tips really did help me in terms of getting over it and moving on forward of keeping things in perspective and really just you know having that control over your your direct environment and growing from there and moving up the ladder. So, you know, I, from personal perspective, um, yeah, it, this all makes a lot of sense. Um, we'll go into a few more questions that are a bit more in terms of situational because, you know, anxiety, it, it usually can come up as, as you mentioned, in very specific situations that can really um, um, bring it up. So we had questions regarding um, how to handle anxiety when dining out or eating out at someone's house dining out at a restaurant, at school, are these kind of coupled together with an answer or is there a strategy for each one? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, so I think overall, I've always, um, you know, eaten at restaurants and people's homes and, you know, in all these different public settings. And I think like there's just basic principles that I'm sure many of the people listening do already. But I mean, I think when you're dealing with anxiety, but you still want to um, be like you don't want to let it bring you down um just be simple so first of all like if you're dealing with a post-reaction anxiety response and you're going to a friend's house it's okay to not want to try like the most extra extravagant thing that they made or to try a new brand of something like i really think especially at the beginning um when you're starting to go back to doing the things you did um when you weren't feeling as anxious like even just go to a friend's house and eat some chips that you're comfortable with will make you feel more confident. So, and same with a restaurant. Um, I do tons of research about restaurants before I go to them. So like from a young age, I always like, even before internet would, you know, like read about them or hear about them and really try to plan ahead of time. So, I mean, I, cause I love to eat, so I don't want to miss out on those things. But I would tell, like, if I was going with my girlfriends, I would say these two restaurants I feel comfortable with, which ones do you want to go to? Um, trying to pick restaurants that take reservations, going when it's not so busy. So like there's general strategies you can do where you're able to feel more comfortable. And I'd always um, 
try to skim the menu before. And if I notice that there's something on it, if they have like peanuts in three different dishes, I'm just not gonna go there, it's not worth it. And yeah, there's been many times where I've also had to bring my own food, um, but for me, it's still just really important to have the social piece. So from a young age, I got used to that. I just wanna eat dessert really anywhere. And now there's, I think a lot better options of um, like allergen friendly places, but I think it's just about, I accepted it and I was still able to live a life that was like, pretty happy and I was pretty confident because I was still doing the things I loved, but I wasn't able to have the cake. So I kind of try to weigh it that way. Um, and of course the basic things, but like mentioned before, always washing your hands before you eat. And I, I wouldn't feel comfortable, like, you know, if we were on a field trip and it was a remote area, I, I wouldn't share food. Like you have the things that are your comfort zones, the things that are your boundaries and you stick to them and then I think it really helps yeah it's helpful you've got your boundaries and it can go into different situations and you expand yeah. the court that's that's great and I, I was chuckling a bit when you said um what you did before the internet to, to stay safe and that's I think true. that's a yeah. That's a webinar in itself food allergy yeah, yeah. and, and what we did way back when it was um, harder. yeah it, it was different that's for sure yeah. that stories yeah. Um, now let's talk about the um, the epinephrine in the room. Um, so this is obviously can be a worry whether it's you know you're using EpiPen or the Allerject. You know, for a lot of for a lot of young kids, um, this this can be an anxiety provoking device. Um, the fear of of needles, the fear that it might hurt. Do you have any tips for for parents or youth that might have some reservations about um, a very helpful life saving device? Yeah, yeah. So. A few things. First of all, like it's hard for kids to remember to even take it. So like on a basic level, just strategies about whether, you know, they make a colorful sign in their room saying, don't forget your EpiPen or trying to build it into like responsibility is helpful. So, you know, that it's just part of, okay, you, you want to like have more responsibility around the house. Well, or part of it is you put it in your bag every morning or however you do it. Um, and then for kids who are really afraid of it, I use like exposure therapy techniques. So basically I will start with, it, it, it um, really commonly relates to fear of needles, right? But so we'll bring like a cartoon image of it and like they're able to look at it and then you can use the practice ones and they're able to touch it. So actually bringing it to the sessions and normalizing it, looking at it sort of, um, so it's not like this unknown, untouchable thing, I think. Um, is really helpful. And then it's easier said than done. It's, you know, it takes work, but I do think viewing it as something, it's your friend, it is a strength. Having like these life saving things actually allow you to go and do all the things you want to do, right? So, yeah, it's annoying to carry around sometimes, but like, is it worth it? And just trying to find ways where they're able to view it more as, yeah, like a life saving device. And the chance you're going to have to use it is very small but isn't it great that we have this thing that we can take with us, right? So kind of viewing it in that way is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can speak firsthand. I've used my uh, my epinephrine on a couple of occasions and it, it works. And that, yeah. that that always helps me keep things in perspective that that is my friend. It will have my back and I will be okay. So, yeah. you know, that's my own worries that I just know it works. So very helpful. Yeah. We're going to squeeze in one last question before we wrap things up, and we're going to talk a little bit about bullying because um, you know this this is unfortunately an area that affects way too many kids with food allergy. So perhaps you could talk about you know how to deal with bullies. Are there any type of um, prevention strategies um, that you could uh, give to parents? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it is really unfortunate, and so and the hard thing is, and I don't want to put it's not all about the person with the food allergy to have to deal with it. But I do think with we as people who have food allergies can find strategies. So when we work on embracing it ourselves, it is easier than to respond. But of course that's a process. But when we're able to say, as they talked about, like the allergy is part of you, it's not your whole identity, but it is part of your identity. And these are my friends who know about it. And this is my support network. And this is the food I can eat. When you when you start to develop this larger identity about it, first of all, you're not then sitting alone being the one 
who has the allergy and is afraid to talk about it, right? You've built up your confidence and your um, resiliency around it. But of course, there are still going to be people who aren't nice about it and people who make you feel bad. And so, I mean, it's some of the, you know, some of the stuff with bullying that we always talk about, but it depends on the age, right? So like my example, when someone was throwing actual peanut shells, that's like an immediate safety risk, right? And I should go to the teacher and probably should have called this person's parents. Like there were a lot of things that just like immediately had to happen because I wasn't safe, right? I think when it's more of those things about making fun of you or sort of making you to feel different, it's really helpful just to say, yeah, it's part of me. I guess you don't get it. And then go on and just really focus on the other people who do. There's always gonna be those people who don't understand whatever, you know, kids have so many different um, things about them. And there's always those kids who just make you feel not good for being a bit different. But then there's so many people who do understand. So I really just try to reframe it in a positive way. I try to ignore them and also try to celebrate it. So if you can bring in allergy friendly cupcakes, you offer it to the bully. If they're like, oh, this isn't as good as the ones I get normally, well, then they're probably not worth it. And I know that's easier said than done, but trying to just like incorporate them into your identity and being one to share, being one to host at your house, like finding ways where you're able to still be social and happy, then you also, it won't matter as much because you do have your strong support network that, you know, is operating without the few people who are making you feel bad about your allergies. Well said. And um, just just to, to to wrap up question period, uh, some of the resources that we mentioned before, I, I highly recommend because they are just following what you're saying in terms of providing more information. If people are looking to dig further, these webinars that uh, the CFL player Thomas Miles did covers some real practical strategies of becoming empowered. And, and my webinar, Rock Your Food Allergy, is all about that type of foundation on your self-identity. So you know, allergy pals, all of these things that we mentioned today, I, I highly recommend if you're looking to get more info on that, that line. Um, Samara, I'll ask you now to turn off your, your webcam and we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here. So although the youth sessions are now complete, we still have two more adult or family sessions this month. There's a session with Dr. Julia Upton on immunotherapy, followed by a session with Dr. Moshe ben Shushan on understanding when to use epinephrine. Both of those sessions will provide further insight from leading allergists, and there will be time for questions from the audience afterwards. So don't miss out, register for those today. And we would like to thank our sponsors for this webinar series, Allergect, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, and the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic. You will get a short survey through GoToWebinar immediately after this webinar that will pop up on your screen. You'll also receive the survey in an email in the next hour. We ask that you please take a few moments to complete it. Your feedback is really crucial in helping us improve our future webinars and to also better understand what additional questions or comments you might have on this topic or more. A recording of this webinar will soon be available. So with that being said, I want to thank Samara for her, her wonderful insight today um, in providing so much really valuable information on this topic. And thank you all so much for coming to this session. We hope you found it informative and helpful. This now concludes the webinar.